Alvaline and Advanced Auto Parts have teamed up this summer to make sure that you're getting the ultimate protection. How? Valvoline Full Synthetic Motor Oils are specially engineered to provide 24 times stronger protection against engine killing contaminants than the leading full synthetic. If you want to maximize the life of your engine, trust the ultimate protection. Trust Valvoline. Get five quarts of Valvoline Full Synthetic Motor Oil for only $32.99 at your local Advanced Auto Parts store today. My dad works in B2B marketing. He came by my school for career day and said he was a big ROAS man. Then he told everyone how much he loved calculating his return on ad spend. My friends still laugh at me to this day. Not everyone gets B2B, but with LinkedIn, you'll be able to reach people who do. Get a $100 credit on your next ad campaign. Go to linkedin.com slash results to claim your credit. That's linkedin.com slash results. Terms and conditions apply. LinkedIn, the place to be, to be. David, it's great to have you in studio, man. Welcome. You are in rarefied air. You are the first five-timer on our show. Where am I? Welcome to What Were They Thinking Studios here in beautiful uh, downtown New Brunswick. I mean, it was a little weird that your 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 chauffeur guy. Um, I, I think he I think he drugged me to get here. I don't think that's the case at all. Uh, what, what, uh, Jeffrey, oh, he's gone. Where, where did he go? Uh, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> he's, you know, he's probably got other corporate gigs. But again, welcome. You're, this is the first time we've had a, we've we've done a, a five movies of of a particular actor, and you're the first. Okay, so you guys are like uh you guys are like an Academy Award podcast or what? Not quite. I mean, we have had some uh, Academy Award winners uh, movies on the show before. Oh, yeah. okay. Like, uh, like you mean like uh, like Green Book or The Shape of Water or like High <laughs> Squad? Uh, I'm I'm sorry. Come again? I said like you know Pearl Harbor. Uh, one more time. Pearl Harbor and Suicide Squad. Okay. Oh, wait a second. Do what? you guys talk about bad movies? Yeah, no, no, to questionable. Okay, just you know, but they're they're still fun. People enjoy them, right? But you guys have done five of my movies. Yes, David, we've done five of your movies, okay. and that that just speaks to your your workhorse quality. But but okay, so I mean, I know you didn't do uh, Ready to Rumble. Or, you know, uh, the WCW pay-per-view Slamboree 2000, <laughs> or uh, 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 Eight-Legged Freaks, or uh, you didn't do any of those, right? Uh, we, we've, done, we've done all of them. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, we tweeted at you with the whole Ready to Rumble, and you were tweeted back, like, it's some people's favorite part, and we were like, it's cool, we're just having some fun, no, 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 no offense. That was like two yeah. years ago. I, but David, just because the movies are iffy doesn't make you a bad person. We, we like what you do, <sighs> clearly. Am I the only member at the moment? Yes, but you will be joined by Gamera in November, huh? Guardian of the Universe, friend all children. Gamera's <laughs> not fake. You get no, no arguments out of me on this one, David. I love Gamera. I am holy. Holy, fully believing in him. Uh, may he fly in turtle greatness uh, forever. Oh God! You, I, I mean, do I? Do I get like a? At least do I get like a cool jacket, like a Saturday Night Live type Five Timers Club thing? Uh, we could. We could probably put something together, a, a uh, t-shirt or a koozie or something. Uh, I don't Nathan, know. Nathan, we don't have money in the budget for a jacket. And then just get, I don't, don't get a jacket. Just get a, get something from Redbubble. Come on, Charles. Sit over in the pool. Come, give me a second. I'll make something real quick. Okay. How about that? Show him that. Show him that. Okay. Hey, David, huh? Uh, huh? What uh, do you think? Uh, yeah, it's fine garment. What a human centipede. What? Uh, was I in that movie? <laughs> no, no. Uh, but, you know, it, it's some of our merchandise, and we want to give it to you. I mean, actually, I mean, if, if this movie was part of the human centipede, human centipede, that is, it would be the middle. You get what I'm saying? Oh. We like to have fun here. <laughs> you know what, guys? I'm out. I'm leaving. I'm leaving. Uh, but David, no, come on. <sighs> well, I mean, at least we got Gamera in November. No, November. Wait until November. Yay. No, Gauss, you've only been on twice. You know when I pick up a movie, I 
Welcome to the show. <laughs> it's a little early, a little early for that. Oh, sorry, sorry. Um, <laughs> this is the What Were They Thinking podcast. My name is Brendan. And I'm Nathan. And we talk about bad to questionable movies every week here on this podcast. Mm-hmm. And that is what we are doing this week. Although we have a staunch defender of this week's movie. Um, we have a first time guest in the house, Nathan. In okay. the house. Hey, welcome to the luxurious downtown New Brunswick. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, from the Your Brain on Facts podcast, Moxie Labouche. Hey, thank you so much for having me. I wish I was in New, Bun- New Brunswick because I am in Virginia and I am schwitzing like crazy. Oh, it's been like that here, though. Um, it's like 41 Celsius with the humidity here the other day. It was disgusting. Damn Commonwealth country and your Celsius. <laughs> I know, just like the rest of the world. <laughs> oh, oh, no. What is this turning into already? <laughs> Here, I'll, I'll bring it back around to a nicer tenor. Bonus <laughs> fact, Celsius and Fahrenheit scales overlap at negative 40 degrees. See? Yes. At negative 40 degrees, we're all friends. <laughs> yeah, yes, Virginia doesn't whole... see negative 40, but I'm... If you guys do, give me a call because I want to, you know, laugh. Oh, we have. Have we seen negative forty? I I know for a fact that I had school canceled once as a child because it was so cold out. Oh man. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know what? Right now, I'm praying for it, and then when it happens, I'll be praying for the opposite, as happens every year. <laughs> You're the worst. With everyone. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Guys, we're talking about a very special movie this week, uh, released in the year of our Lord, 1999. Um, Oh, are we going to party? (laughs) Yeah, just like Prince. Um, Uh, The film is called... It is is the hallmark by which all partying is judged. Well, yes. Yes. Yeah, you you, got to rate your party on the Prince scale. Yes. We must party like... It is 1999. It is what we strive for, yet may never attain. Yeah, so Hmm. like crappy internet connections, uh, questionable romantic comedies. uh. Jankos. (laughs) Plastic choker necklaces. I managed to spend the New Year's Eve of 1999 the way most people thought they were going to spend the New Year's of 1999. uh, In a basement in the hills of New Brunswick with no power. Yeah. You were ahead of the we're, curve. You were we ready. Were having a par- yep, you were, we were like, having a party, and, and someone took out a power line and knocked the power out of the house. <laughs> oh, my God. You were like, I better get ready for this early because <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be the end of the world in 10 minutes. Ah, I feel fine. Weirdly enough, we might be closer to that these days. Anyway, <laughs> on that happy note, we're going to be talking about a film called Ravenous, uh, starring one Guy Pierce, Robert Carlyle, and even though he's on the poster, David Arquette, although he's not in this movie very much. Not a whole lot, no, but uh, playing to his strengths. <laughs> it's not a big cast, though. It isn't. So, I mean, everyone in it has a reasonably substantial role, considering... There's like a dozen people in the movie total. And unfortunately, mm. um, as Nathan and I were kind of talking about before we went on, uh, one of those substantial roles is uh, Jeffrey Jones. Why are we saying it with distress? Well, I mean, he's a con- confessed pederast. Oh, all right. I forgot about that bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, which makes, as I've said many times on this podcast, makes Ferris Bueller's Day Off very weird to watch now. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I mean, it's, yeah, I I feel, uh, you know, that, uh, I mean, it was, what, 2002, so he's, he's 20 years on, mm-hmm. I, I feel a guy can maybe change, possibly, um, but it's still kind of uncomfortable to talk about. Yeah, so, I mean, we'll oh, just say... Well, he was really ahead of the trend. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, cancel culture was so 1999. That was... <laughs> Uh, mm. so ravenous. So before we get into it, actually, because, um, a little behind the curtain here, 
even though this was technically my pick, I did ask Moxie if she had a, a movie preference on what she would like to talk about, and she selected Ravenous. So why don't you tell us uh, just briefly why you wanted to talk about Ravenous? I love this movie. And any time I am fortunate enough to guest star on a pop culture or movie podcast that doesn't already have a topic lined up, I make them watch Ravenous. Because it was grossly underviewed and underappreciated in its time, largely because <laughs> the studio did not know what to do with it. This Emphasis is on gross. <laughs> it's not as gory as it could have been. I mean, it's not like, you know, trauma or anything, but mm -hmm. um, it is it is a, a movie about cannibalism. But again, it could be a lot more gory than it is. And it's a black comedy. But if you go and watch the trailers, which I am not advocating, at least until after you've seen the film, you you would not have any idea what the movie was or what it was about or why you should want to see it. And, you know, if the trailer sucks, nobody goes and sees the movie. Mm -hmm. You know, back in the day, at least. I only watched it because I worked at a blockbuster, just to date myself a little bit. <laughs> and we got five free rentals a week. And I'm like, this thing... <laughs> Like, I probably had just watched the full Monty and like, oh, hey, that's the same guy, you know, and train spotting and, and he's Begbie and train spotting. I'm like, yeah, I'll get this. Loved it. Few people have seen it. Everyone remembers it. It can be polarizing. You, mm -hmm. Nobody's going to be middling on this film. But I find that four out of five people really enjoy it. That fifth person, ooh, not so much. And also it has the most amazing score oh, that would yes. not work anywhere else. Yeah, that that actually is one thing before we even get into it is the score in this movie is fantastic. It's so wild and it seems so out of place, but I think that's why it works. Yeah, and it, it, nothing else would work in this movie and that score would not work anywhere else. Even that style I don't think would work because it vacillates between a fairly standard orchestral movie style and then banjo and, you know, just like a couple of Appalachian uh, instruments and some weird, a, some weird singing. And there's a couple of times where some really dark stuff happens and then it turns into like a really macabre Benny Hill sketch. Yes, there is. There is the chase, the chase music, which is sort of mountain folk yakety sax. Yeah. <laughs> oh, now I want a mountain folk Benny Hill show. <laughs> Um, well, we you know it would have Larry Cable Guy on it. <laughs> so I take I, I, I take that back. I take everything Good. back I just said. Good. Just, just go back and watch reruns of Cops set in West Virginia. You'll get enough <laughs> redneck chase scenes to to suit you. Run, Ronnie, run! Y'all's brutalizing me. <laughs> so the budget for this movie is twelve million dollars, mm. um, and the total gross for the box at the box office was two point zero six million dollars. It's the studio's fault. Yeah, it's not a not. A I, I I I'm a hundred percent with Miss Labouche on this one, um, simply because uh, I do remember. I didn't see this movie. This is the first time I'd seen it was when I did it for this, mm -hmm. but I do remember it came out, and I said, "Oh, that looks kind of kind of cool. It looks like a, a horror movie," and then it just it just dropped right off my radar, and every every once in a while I I would pop up on like I don't know like. A, trivia night or something and they'd be like oh yeah it's that one with the, the guy Pierce and the dude from the full money <laughs> I should see that sometime and then I never do and now you have and now I have and we start this movie off with a, a very um, interesting quote a, a, a pair of quotes um, we start off with a quote from the great philosopher Frederick Nietzsche who says he that fights with monsters should look to it that he himself does not become monster and then Nathan what is the next quote well, the next quote I actually believe was Nietzsche, but they attributed it to Anonymous, and it's just, eat me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the so. setting is the Mexican-American War, 1847. Mm -hmm. They're having a party, and Captain yes. John Boyd is there, played by Guy Pierce, Getting a medal from uh, uh, Jack DeVito or Danny Nicholson, because <laughs> he looked like a mixture of Jack Nicholson and Danny DeVito. <laughs> A perfect hybrid, you might say. Yeah. Um, so Captain John Boyd, again, Guy Pierce, is being honored for bravery in battle. Although we get some flashbacks to tell us that he might not have been so brave. No, no. And, Quite and, the opposite, uh, in fact. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah. He uh, he played dead, as a matter of fact. Um, and because he remembers back to basically lying under a pile of bodies and having their blood and guts drip all over him, uh, makes it very hard to eat a rare steak. Uh, of which mm. I have to say, and maybe controversially, eating a rare steak makes it difficult for me to eat a rare steak. No. I'm, I'm I'm cool with that. I I enjoy a nice uh, rare to medium rare steak cooked to to a crisp. <laughs> oh, so you you're you're awful. I mean, this is I your just, show, but you may leave. Oh, you, you, all you right, sweet. You guys just so, let me know when you're done. I will uh, edit the episode. Uh, <laughs> now, mid mid rare is what God intended. So you get a nice sear and crust, but you still get all of the juice. Oh, right, can't it's do it. Moist. <laughs> really can't. I just do wanted it now. to ruin someone's day by saying moist in my NPR voice. Uh, So after he uh, fails to eat this uh, rare steak, it actually gets him to the point of uh, vomiting. And Mm -hmm. his commander at that point realizes he can't eat a rare steak. I was a little confused here because he says, oh, you're clearly not a man and i wasn't sure if he like knew that he was a traitor or if he was just like you can't even eat a steak and you puke what you're not yeah a man. no it wasn't that he knew that he was a traitor okay. it, was, it was he knew that he was a coward yeah, okay a because yeah they do have like um uh some some i don't know <laughs> mental adr later uh where he's basically they run it down again that he pretended to be dead um, and but they didn't want to court martial him because it would send the wrong message. Because after he pretended he was dead, he took the uh, the enemy's uh, fortress. Right, yeah, he took, right. He took the enemy base, and so he's eating the steak at a ceremony. F- I guess related to his uh, promotion. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Correct. And, but the, but his CO is like, I wouldn't have done this if I didn't have to. So I'm shipping you off. To mm-hmm. a remote Enjoy. post in the California <laughs> Sierra Nevada mountains. Enjoy your stay at Worst Western. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, yes. I believe the name is uh, Fort Spencer. Mm-hmm. I believe so. Yes, Fort Spencer, and he arrives at the camp and is, uh, you know, shown uh, shown around by Martha, who is a Native American woman who is given, uh, I believe, three lines in the film. Um, but is the hero. Yeah. Is absolutely the hero, yes. <laughs> but but I, I think she only speaks later on. And I don't even remember if she had... I think she had a couple of English lines. Yeah, yeah, she, yeah she, has, she, she has a few lines. Yeah. She explains the whole... Wendigo um, thing. Wendigo and, Wendigo. and well, how to it. She explains half yeah. of it. Her brother, George. Uh, George and Martha are the names given to two... Uh, indigenous persons who were sort of at Fort Spencer when the U.S. Army took it over. It was built as a Spanish mission. I have seen the film enough times. I can just do it for you if you like. (laughs) (laughs) If there's any part you're not sure about, I'll just recite it for you. You are our fact checker. (laughs) Neither neither George nor nor Martha has a huge amount of dialogue, but Martha is actually a pretty important uh, character. And the the finale, which I won't uh, spoil for you now, she's the best part of oh yeah and we'll yeah we'll get we'll get to that for sure early on though she kind of seems like a little she kind of seems inconsequential until much later on um but she is yeah she's showing him around and of course we get more flashbacks of people dying in battle and more more kind of taking a closer look at boyd uh faking his death uh so he you know could escape or whatever um and then we meet colonel hart played by jeffrey jones um (laughs) Uh, it, we'll let's just say it now. Yes, we're all aware of Jeffrey Jones and who he is. We're just going to talk about him in this movie. All right, cool, cool. Um, he welcomes Boyd with a walnut, and he uses books like they're meant to be used, cracking walnut shells. Right. <laughs> I'd actually, I, I'd expected him to, to scold uh, Guy Pierce on being AWOL nine times this year. Is that what he, what? Nine what? times. <laughs> No, I said I, I had expected oh, him to scold I him for being you. AWOL. Oh, are we we're referencing nine. something else, are we? <laughs> yeah, just just a little movie called Ferris Bueller. Uh, yeah, no, I, I saw it. I saw it once. Uh, oh, oh, Nathan just had a stroke. <laughs> yeah. Um, crap, what was I going to say? He has great big heavy books because his hobby is reading in classic languages, in the original languages, because there is Sweet Fanny Adams to do up at Fort Spencer, especially over yeah. the winter, which they're in the midst of. 
yeah, they basically say like you better find some way to entertain yourself because the tedium will kill you faster than anything else. <laughs> he asked him if, if he has any if he has any uh, hobbies and he's I like <laughs> swimming. I hope you don't mind swimming in hard water. <laughs> He does introduce the rest of the crew, which might have one of my f- favorite jokes in the whole movie. Um, we have Toffler, the man of the cloth, uh, played by Jeremy Davis, Davies. Uh, Knox, the drunk uh, f- veterinarian. Uh, Martha and George, of course, we already talked about. Private Cleves, the stoner and cook, played by David Arquette. And Reich the soldier who is a blonde haired blue eyed soldier named Reich, which I thought was re- very funny. But a bit on a bit on the nose. Yeah. <laughs> a bit on the nose, but still made me chuckle. <laughs> yeah. And he is introduced, by the way, by uh standing in water and shirtless and just screaming at the top of his lungs. <laughs> which is I mean, if you're gonna meet Neil McDonough, that's the best way. And it's like ice it's like ice water because it's all frozen all around him and he's just standing in this creek up to his waist screaming with his fists clenched and biceps curled it's not right? un- not unattractive to look at see what i mean <laughs> best way to meet neil mcdonald <laughs> so my question is early on um because we said that private cleaves is the resident stoner and also cook uh played by david arquette it, it, it's either is it either, is it very good or bad to have a stoner as your cook excellent you're going to get flavor combinations you could never have dreamed of in your worst fever. Yeah, not not gonna lie, I've I've come up with some of the best things to eat whilst whilst inebriated. Okay, of course so we do hear their shopping list, so we know he's a bit <laughs> limited in his options. You know that it's <laughs> it's beans, flour, bacon. You know, it's basic basic Oregon Trail supplies. Right. Well, I mean, you cook you cook the bacon, you take the grease, you could oh my goodness, the stuff you could do. Hey with man, I'm in the alone. south. You don't have to tell me about bacon grease. We're, <laughs> so, we're not legally or morally allowed to throw it away. It has to go in the jar. <laughs> right. So you cook with it. Sometimes you just dab some bread in it when you're real hard. I just up. I just dab a little behind my ears before I go out. There you go. <laughs> Time to face the day. For a brief moment, I thought you said, when you said you take the bacon, you take the grease, I thought we were going to get a facts of life moment there from you. <laughs> I was afraid he was going to be working blue. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we never work blue on this show. Never. Not me. Never. I'm. He's basically uh, the. Uh, Je- no, I wasn't going to. I'm not going to say that. I was going to say Jeff Dunham. I don't want to bring you down like that, Nathan. <laughs> Oof. Why would you do? I, I like puppets, I but mean, I, I, that's that's about where I draw the line. He was funny twenty years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Your puppets are not uh, deeply offensive. Well, not all of his puppets are deeply offensive. Well, one in particular, I guess. One of them is super duper offensive. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um. So no, it's just it's just that the one is so offensive. We forgot how offensive <laughs> the other ones were supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs> it just really overshadows it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, so ravenous. Mm-hmm. Um, more flashbacks, et cetera, et cetera. And then we get, um, so Cleves and Martha are sent to ta- go to town for supplies, which is important because they're leaving right now. So they won't see any of the stuff that happens for the next little while. And right. David Arquette is told to not get distracted by women or peyote. Well, yes. Women pay peyote or, loco uh, weed. loco weed. Yeah. yeah. And, it and it's be Martha's that- job to babysit him, basically. Like, <laughs> yeah, it probably she- would have been easier on her to make the supply run herself than to have to do it with him. Yeah, I don't know why they have to say- I mean, I guess in case you're one not- of them gets hurt or something. I know, no, you're not going to, at that time in, 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 in society, you're not going to trust a woman, a native woman, to do the shopping. Uh, I guess. I'm sorry, did you just say you wouldn't trust a woman to go grocery shopping? No, he's- In, 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 it, in that time, In that yes. time, they wouldn't you would, have. They happily- let Martha do the worst stuff. Later in the yeah. film, she has to walk all the way to the next fort. Right. <laughs> so, no, they would be more than happy to, to, to put all of the scut work maybe onto they just, George and Martha. Maybe they just wanted to get rid of Cleves. Maybe George was like, hey, guys, can that, you say that could Cleves? be it. They're just like, get him out from under our feet for, for two <laughs> he, days. He, he, he does describe him as the over-medicated Cleves. Over-medicated yeah. private Cleves, yeah. I think George was probably like, can you send Cleves away for a bit? Because like, he's going through my weed way too fast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he, he puff puffs, he never passes. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, because most of David Arquette's lines are just him laughing while stoned. So they go to town for supplies. Um, shortly after this, we uh, see a strange man outside the window, and everybody is like, oh, 
who is who is that? He he's hurt. He's uh, he seems to be a little bit bloodied. He he unco- he loses consciousness, and they bring him inside and quickly clean him off and bundle him up. And we learn that this is uh, the great Robert Carlyle, who is playing mm-hmm. a character named Col- Calhoun or Colhoun. F W Calhoun. Calhoun, servant of F-W. God. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you have seen this movie many times, Moxie. Did I not say every time I get to get on a movie podcast that doesn't have a movie picked out, I make them watch Ravenous, which means, hey, honey, we're watching Ravenous tonight. And he's clearly the great, great, great grandfather of movie legend Rory Calhoun. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah. I, I got to say, though, like when you mentioned Robert Carlyle in being in Train Spotting and um, The Full Monty, it just really makes me appreciate him so much in this movie because he is so different here. Like it's just night and day. Your man has range. Uh, he yeah. played Hitler in a miniseries. And mm-hmm. I'm like, yeah, yeah. I'm like, when I saw it announced, I'm like, yeah, he can do that. <laughs> yeah, he can do <laughs> anything. I'm, and I'm what convinced. was funny was, was the same time that miniseries was on, on another network, was a, a miniseries about um, Martha Stewart. So I taped them both. And I, and I wrote, like, cassette of pure evil. Because I think we still had a VCR <laughs> at that point. <laughs> I, I only hope he played Martha Stewart. No, I'm not sure he was in that one. I think he was too oh. busy being in little leather shorts and, and a toothbrush <laughs> mustache. <laughs> well, <sighs> once he uh, once he recovers, he introduces himself and he says he's been out in the wilderness for about three months. He tells everyone a story about how he was with a uh, a party of of men and women, and mm-hmm. they got they got lost and they got stranded. And you know this this evil man named Colonel Ives. Uh, they were well. They resorted to cannibalism, and this evil man named Colonel Ives kind of took advantage of that after a while, and just started killing people and eating them. Well, it was basically the, the Donner Party, so yeah, the dramatization yes. of the Donner Party, because their guide did not actually know the way. They mm-hmm. set off uh, too late in the year. They got trapped in impassable snow and had to hide in a cave. Whereupon they exhausted their food stores. And they ate the dogs and the oxen and the horses, and it seemed like they ate them kind of fast, <laughs> judging just the timeline he describes. I'm like, five people went through th- two oxen and three horses and a dog? At least at least with the Donner Party, it was like, what, 50 people? Yeah. It, was, it was a lot of people, yeah. <laughs> yeah, not six. Yeah, so I, they... I, feel an, I feel a couple of oxen could last six people a few months. It just reminds yeah. me of that uh, that episode of South Park where they're locked like, in the... What are you, the, people uh... diabetic? We got to eat again. It's been 45 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> um, Incidentally, after while watching this movie, I always, the whole time I wanted to watch Cannibal, uh, the musical. Well, it's kind of based on Alfred Packer. Both of them are. Yeah. In a way. I'm not sure where we cut to here, but I know George comes into the picture here to talk about the Wendigo. Wendigo? Wendigo. Mm -hmm. Wendigo. And this is the first mention of that, and he basically says, you know, the Wendigo, um, someone eats someone's flesh, and they steal their essence or their spirit, and they continue to crave the flesh. And I said, I wonder if that will factor into this plot. (laughs) Gee, you think? Chekhov's (laughs) Wendigo? (laughs) Chekhov's Wendigo. (laughs) <laughs> if I could just say a little bit about the the actual Wendigo, mm-hmm. this is about as close a representation of the Wendigo legend of the the native tribes of the northern reaches of North America, so the Jibwa um, and and that nation. It does not have horns or antlers. There was one B movie that used antlers. And now everybody puts antlers on their Wendigo. <laughs> and it is described as basically Slender Man, sort of a, a Slender Man White Walker who mm-hmm. is both caused by and embodies the desperation of like February, where you are down to the bottom of your food stores and spring is nowhere near in sight. And the Wendigo feeds not only on people generally, but specifically on people who wander away from the safety of their community. And the yeah, Wendigo we, is, is insatiable and he can never consume enough human flesh. Interesting tidbit. Um, it's a tidbit, that's tidbit interesting. Is interesting. Exactly. Yeah. Um, this is the second time uh, we've had the Wendigo on our uh, podcast. Is it? Yep. Lone Ranger. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Remember? Uh, William Fickner? I do. I do. Yeah. 
I'm sure he was blocking it out. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. That movie had the one thing that I wish this movie had had. It would have made this this movie stick a thousand times better if Barry Pepper had been there. Oh, Barry Pepper would have been great. Barry Pepper. With his mustache. Barry Pepper needs to be in every period piece from this time period, though. Yes. Yeah. And With that mustache and that accent. And Battlefield Earth. So, right. ravenous. <laughs> they do They do get a fun uh, Body of Christ gag uh, with the Wendigo. Because he, they, they mention, uh, he says something to the effect People that, don't still uh, do this, do they? Yeah. <laughs> Catholics do it every Sunday. <laughs> oh, right, right. <laughs> white man eats the body of jesus christ every sunday yeah <laughs> um so they decide to uh go off in search of some of the uh the party that was lost because you know uh calhoun says i'm not sure what happened i think ives and the woman are still out there so they said well this is our job we finally get some action let's get out there and find these people well when it came down to calhoun and the only female in the party he knew of the two of them he was next yeah, yeah. So that's so why he, he fled. Es- he yeah. escaped exactly. Um, by the way, while they're searching for them, uh, Calhoun has the best goggles I've ever seen. Oh, they're amazing! Right, straight out of steampunk, man. <laughs> he Free looks like steampunk. a giant insect. It's great. <laughs> and uh, and during this whole excursion, a Toffler, the man of the cloth, uh, falls down a cliff and gets a very nasty leg injury. I believe his bone comes out of the skin. Ugh, so much no he gets he gets uh injured in the stomach oh is it? it oh right 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 yeah, right, yeah. it's 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 uh old guy yeah, Pierce he is, that he has a, gets a the gut wound yeah spare rib right it's boyd boyd yeah. who gets the compound fracture later yeah right right i knew it happened at some point this movie now i know you mentioned it's not like as gory as it could be but i still found it pretty gory like it just yeah i guess it was more like disturbing uh blood than anything else well because it's realistic type of injury when, yeah. when the gore is you know a machete to the head you haven't experienced that but when it when it's a, a realistic looking gut wound or a broken bone you can feel those exactly yeah, yeah bro- oh, broken bones are like yeah th- that's like near the top of my list that and teeth or eye stuff looking at you the dentist <laughs> i love the actually when he fell down, uh, <laughs> Wright goes chasing after him because he's like, he's all right. Are you all right? <laughs> yeah, he'll be fine. I think his eyes are open, so he's he's yeah. probably alive. It struck me a lot like a, a big brother uh, who had just like hit his little brother a little too hard and was like yeah. trying to get him not to cry. So mom didn't hear. <laughs> like, you're fine. You're fine. You're fine. Shh, quiet. <laughs> but they make they make camp and Toffler wakes up freaking out in the middle of the night and in one of the best line deliveries in this movie okay, okay uh, we're we gonna fight over who gets to deliver this line oh go ahead <laughs> i'm gonna step back from my mic sorry okay. for the peeking he was licking me <laughs> yes best. that's right and calhoun. i know my husband can hear that in the next room <laughs> <laughs> calhoun was licking his wound as he slept and, of course, everyone else finds this to be a bit strange. Just a, just a skosh. Even Jeffrey Jones. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta oh, have a limit to, somewhere, man. <laughs> we have to come to it at some point. Um, yeah, everyone finds it a little strange. And uh, Calhoun is like, I don't know what happened. I had a nightmare. And I guess I had to wake up and lick a wound. <laughs> I woke up and my lips were on his <laughs> yeah, wound. Yeah, yeah, yes. <laughs> I know. Just and like, then he asks to be restrained. It's just a funny excuse. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, he does ask to be restrained. And while he is restrained the next day while they're traveling, um, Reich has a grand old time pushing and shoving him around. I don't fully blame him because he is clearly a madman. <laughs> Did I, I want to ask, am I the only one who noticed that they kicked over a pile of fabric when it was supposed to be snow? <laughs> I, I did I not. That. I'm going to do a time yes. stamp on that. There, <laughs> <laughs> when they're uh the next morning when they're walking before they discover the cave they're walking through and it's supposed to have like some sparse uh snow on the ground in the woods and stuff like that um i think it's robert carlisle who stumbles forward and it like it kicks up like he kicked a sheet not like he kicked a bunch of snow oh wow <laughs> that's I, pretty- immediately after this recording i have to Does go it- and check that 
Man, it makes me, it makes me um, it's just crazy because this is like your first viewing, and I've seen this so many times I've never caught that. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad. Um, yeah, they find and then they find the cave uh, where they were staying, and Calhoun has a full blown panic attack. Like he's like, I, I can't. He's well, he doesn't say anything because he's like hyperventilating and everything, and you know, gesturing with his hands. Yeah, and gesturing with his hands. It's oh, not only a cannibal, but also dining on scenery <laughs> in this scene <laughs> but in the best way possible uh toffler is pretty freaked out by calhoun's weird like breathing and gesturing and then i know we'll talk about what happens in the cave in a second but one of my favorite things in this whole scene is where calhoun is like making the gestures and then he notices that like toffler's not really paying attention anymore and he clearly like drops his act like <laughs> Like, mm. he just kind of goes, ugh, fuck it. And, <laughs> and I'm fine. <laughs> exactly. And then just comes after him. Um, because in the cave, Reich and Boyd, we didn't talk about Guy Pierce a lot, but Boyd is Guy Pierce. Um, He's on screen for 23 minutes before he speaks. They're 23 minutes into the movie. <laughs> He's the, supposed to be the main character. And, I, and then I, after the, even after that, I don't think he has very many lines in general. Yeah. Well, we're not missing much based on the lines he had. We're just here to see Robert Carlyle. <laughs> that is that is that is true. Um, but they do discover skeletons in the cave, and one of those skeletons they see underneath the uniform says Ives. So we know Calhoun is the one who killed and ate everyone. Yeah, there was and... one too many, one too many skeleton, and an amazing <laughs> music sting, which was was bouncing around my head for for like years. Just this loose bit of sound, and then I realized. It's not only in this movie, but there's a bit in The Last Unicorn that sounds almost <laughs> identical to this. Wow, and, that and is a cut. <laughs> the satisfaction of finding that. Like, you ever had, like, a little something rolling? Like, you can't remember an actor's name or something that's just escaping you? Right. Well, this was this went on for a really, really long time. So the satisfaction yeah. of having that resolved was palpable. Another great film that I remember better than a lot, a lot of other people I discovered when I did a burlesque routine based on it, and nobody knew what the hell I was doing. <laughs> you, st- you start to think that you're crazy, that you never saw that movie or television show in your entire life, and you just realize that your existence is futile because you know you're insane because nobody knows this thing that you're talking about. And then you finally find it, and you're like, ah. Oh. Walking Nathan, Mandela effect. Nathan, Nathan, we've, yeah. Nathan, we've we've gone through the therapy that is never too young to die. Baron Stain Bear. You, 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 it was a movie. We've confirmed that. <laughs> yes, it is a movie, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Are you okay? Yeah. Yeah, I'm good. All right. Yeah. Okay. Just wanted to make sure. Just want to check on you. Mm-hmm. Okay. Good. Good. Yeah. So Calhoun is like, fuck it. And he uh, he stabs Hart, Jeffrey Jones, and shoots George uh, before chasing. And I mean, we find out a little bit later, but chasing and killing Toffler. And I think he disembowels him. <laughs> Well, yeah, because he's, he's eating him. But you you glossed over one of my major problems with the film, and oh. that is the bog-standard spaghetti western shooting someone in a high place, and they do a 270-degree straight-bodied <laughs> flip forward. <laughs> Nobody just crumples to the ground. They have to leap from their high place to die. Yeah, it's a real, it's a real uh, John Wayne and the Searchers moment. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, take it around. Well, you know, I mean, come on, everyone. No, you know what I'm talking about? Searchers? Nope. You know nope, when? A, you know it. one of John Wayne's last films? He was cast as Genghis Khan, <laughs> and they filmed it downwind of a nuclear test site. And it <laughs> likely led to like half the people in the crew and casts like early deaths or something. Substantially like that? high incidence of cancer. Yes. Yep. Hollywood filmmaking in the fifties, sixties, sixties, maybe seventies. Yeah, yeah. so, it, yeah, he kills George, he kills uh, Toffler, he, we'll just say for now, he kills Hart, Jeffrey Jones, he stabs him, and, uh, and yeah, the music is insane. Uh, Boyd and Reich uh, start chasing him through the woods, start chasing Calhoun through the woods, and they find Toffler. This is Toffler. the macabre Benny Hill sketch I was telling you about <laughs> earlier. <laughs> yes. Um, and then they're, they're on the edge of a mountain, and... Boyd is like, you know what? Fuck this. Let's turn around. And Reich is like, you're a fucking pussy, basically. Well, he kind of is, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, he is, yeah. I guess we're, we're supposed to... Uh, Boyd is essentially a coward for most of this yeah, movie. I've, I've heard that discretion is the better part of valor. That's, that's what I've been told. 
old. <laughs> well, they didn't yeah, but know my that D&D character is like that. Like, I see no reason why we should go into the dark cave and we could just go back to the tavern where it was warm and bright. But that's probably right? why nobody likes playing with me a second time. My character is basically <laughs> Chucky Finster as a wizard. <laughs> Man. Uh, I love the references coming hot on this episode. Um, yes. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, I, I probably would have, uh, if I had been Toffler, I probably would have shot, uh, <laughs> probably would have shot Calhoun a long time ago. But <laughs> nevertheless, um, he manages to throw a knife into Reich's chest. Reich tumbles off the cliff. Seemingly, so much tumbling in this movie. Oh, so much tumbling. Seemingly to his death. I think Boyd then is like, okay, yeah, Boyd shoots him like full on with a shotgun or with a rifle in the mm-hmm. chest. And then I know you notice this, Nathan, because he sits up like the goddamn Undertaker. He certainly does <laughs> gut it in. And he has like the 90, like the mid 90s Undertaker outfit to boot. To boot. It's yeah. great. <laughs> with that Kung Lao hat. Oh, Two so great good. things that go great together. Oh, so much <laughs> 90s in one delightful package. And I think Boyd, to get away, he jumps off the cliff, right? He does. Okay. Because I wrote... Which leads to... Mo- which he hits... He lands in the algae tree, hits every branch on the way down. <laughs> which I wrote, like, I don't know. I think it would have taken my chances with Robert Carlyle. <laughs> That's kind of like being in a tall building on fire. It's, True. you know, the, the fire or jumping. Yeah. It reminded me of uh, uh, what happened to... Was it uh, Max Perlich in Cliffhanger? Oh, yeah. Remember when they got away, but he survived because he, he landed in the tree and hit every branch as he fell down and broke his fall. Yeah. And then his buddy mm. got killed. Poor guy. Yeah, that was unfortunate. But, you know, <laughs> ravenous. Ravenous. <laughs> um, as Boyd uh, takes the longest tumble this side of Hot Rod uh, down the mm. cliff, he uh, sees that Reich is barely alive. And in his last gasp of life, he tries to choke Boyd and kill him. <laughs> Now, yes. this bit confused me for a long time, and I think I just finally understand it, because what we have, for those who haven't seen it, is we have uh, the characters have fallen into like a pit, and they've kind of brought tree along with them, and Boyd is down in the pit, and Reich is hanging upside down from, he's like tangled in the tree, and he seems to be dead, but then all of a sudden he's zombie-like jump scare lurches for Boyd. I think what happened was when he was inverted, enough blood got to his brain for him to regain enough consciousness to say, I want to kill that motherfucker real quick. <laughs> Just for a wee bit. Just for a couple of seconds. Yep. Because uh, Reich has never liked Boyd, of course, leading up to this. Um, so what he tries and Boyd just like, you know, pushes him off and Reich finally dies. As Boyd is laying there, uh, Calhoun is coming down to inspect, but he doesn't see them. Uh, Boyd is eating twigs and leaves for the most part until he's like, "Well, I guess I better, uh, I guess I better eat my buddy to survive." And he stabs Reich in the leg, and off screen has a nice, uh, delicious oh, meal. After after yelling and telling him, saying, "Tell me what to do! Tell me what to do!" Yeah. Yeah. He's he's having a really understandable nervous breakdown as he's at the bottom of a pit. He has a compound fra- fracture that I think the femur, I think because I think it was the femur, not the lower legs, but mm-hmm. bad either way. Middle of nowhere, being chased by a madman, and he wasn't really suited to that life to start with. So, yeah, totally understandable mental breakdown. And just when he finally makes that decision, just just yelling at Reich's corpse, "You're dead. You're safe." <laughs> <laughs> you know, and envying him because Reich's out of danger now. He doesn't have well, to suffer through this anymore. Well, and and Moxie, I, I I did skip over something. I did skip over another great line and great delivery, which I'll I'll hand the floor over to you again because I know you love this movie. Um, and I'll what take does, the floor regardless. <laughs> uh, what does Cal, what does Calhoun say when he tries to shoot Toffler at first and his gun won't start? <laughs> oh, that is so annoying. <laughs> great, great i am available great. to do that robert carlisle impression professionally thank you just uh, okay e- call listening? us here in the studio <laughs> yep uh call in right now we're live um <laughs> uh where are we here so well the other really good line from that part is after he he drops the gun and he's just staring at him and then robert carlisle goes run <laughs> and, just, yeah. and then the benny hill music so he's the undertaker and bray wyatt got it 
<laughs> there you go. <laughs> he is all things. <laughs> um, so Boyd eventually uh, manages to limp his way back to camp where uh, Cleves has returned and sees him and has uh, Knox, a.k.a. the drunken veterinarian, uh, take care of his injuries. And remember earlier, he, <laughs> Boyd was uh, warned not to get sick. So obviously this prob- this might not turn out so good, but uh, nothing really <laughs> happens. Um, but Boyd does ask Martha how to stop a Wendigo. But Martha is very upset because she thinks that Boyd had something to do with George's death because George did not return. It is only Boyd coming back to camp. And uh, she finally says, though, you cannot stop it without sacrificing yourself. <gasps> Will that come back into play? Stay tuned. Yes, again, Chekhov's Wendigo. <laughs> I, I- Whatever's more blatant than foreshadowing is what that is. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, it's pretty blatant. Roadmap. <laughs> uh, Boyd is confronted by, um, what was his name again? Something, uh, Nicholson, Danny Nicholson? Jack DeVito? Oh, yeah, yes, Danny Nicholson. The, 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 the Danny DeVito and Jack Nicholson hybrid. Yeah. And he's basically like, okay, this story you got about, like, the cannibal and all this nonsense, can you come up with a better story? Because that's bullshit. <laughs> I ain't feeling oh, is it, that. Is it, is it the, the colonel? Is that the one that you're saying looks like a, the blonde colonel is the one you're saying looks like no. cross between Danny DeVito and Jack Nicholson? The, the guy yes. from, well, the guy from the beginning that was like, you're a coward, go to Fort Spencer. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's, it's the same guy. He shows back up again. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was wondering, like, am I forgetting somebody? Because that description wasn't ringing any. That's <laughs> not how I would describe him. But, you know, takes all kinds, as they say, takes all kinds. <laughs> Well, he was he was the the federal agent in uh, the Rock. That's really how I remember him. But it's the it's the the, the ruddy shrubbery upon his face that really sends home the, <laughs> the Jack Nicholson, the Danny ruddy DeVito shrubbery of a man. Yes. Um. So he uh, he basically yeah he's told like uh, that yeah I don't believe you that's nonsense and he says hey by the way meet our new colonel turns around and it's Colonel Ives aka. Uh, Calhoun, Burl. and he's all cleaned oh. up. And what, what was that? Burl. <laughs> oh, I was really hoping that his first name was Burl. By the way, the whole time. <laughs> Colonel Did you know B. that Ives. most of your most of your favorite uh, Christmas carols were written by Jews? Uh, that makes that totally tracks. Yeah, and and uh, three of the best well known ones were actually written during a heat wave by the songwriters trying to think cool thoughts. I did a whole episode on it uh, last Christmas. See, Nathan, that's what I've been telling you. It's warm. You should be writing Christmas songs. I should be writing and and not watching Hallmark Channel's Christmas. No, no. Why would you do that? (laughs) Have your testicles withered and just or just retracted into your body? Because I Uh, I, look, I don't want to, you know, go toxic masculinity on this, but I'm pretty sure you've already done it. Hand in your penis at this point. (laughs) See? You said you didn't want to. Wow. I didn't want to. I sort of have to. You're watching Hallmark Channel Christmas movies in the summertime. It's 2020. I say live your best life. <laughs> hey, man, if this is if this is how you want to punish yourself, I mean, I, you know, prefer whips and chains and stuff. But whatever your individual masochism is, wow. you know, we're not here to kink shame. This podcast has taken a turn. My safety word is sugar plum fairy. I'm just going to. So ravenous. That's going to be uh, hard ravenous. to say around the the ball gag. <laughs> 1999 you, you get you get it you train your ear to hear it eventually. ravenous yeah. starring yeah. guy pierce my safe word is harder see that's not a that's not a good safe word at all depends on the night <laughs> keep trying you can just show back somehow ives oh, is the colonel you'll get, it, you'll get it back in post <laughs> you sure the one that edits, edits it <laughs> Ravenous? Oh, that's future Brendan's problem. <laughs> Ravenous. So wait, Ravenous. so we see I'm trying that so hard. Ives. So we see that Ives is the colonel, and then for whatever reason, Boyd physically throws himself into a corner on the floor. Oh, yeah, he's completely traumatized. The fact <laughs> Very that, I, dramatic. that that Calhoun is alive, and um, he tells him like he finally, you know, makes enough sense to say that he, you know shot the guy and he said and they they decide to check uh you know ives or calhoun's i guess he's really calhoun but they decide to check calhoun's uh shoulders for any kind of like wounds but lo and behold nothing there behold the wolverine-esque healing powers of cannibalism yeah that's why wolverine oh shit was wolverine a cannibal (laughs) i mean (laughs) we can't rule it out he's been through some stuff but does does marvel's wendigo have healing factor 
because <laughs> their Windigo is basically a Yeti, so I'm not expecting a great deal of, of consistency with the myth. Hmm. <laughs> I don't know. I'll uh, I'll contact Kevin Faggy right now. Well, this would be a good thing to toss out to our gentle listener that they can uh, post on social media and tag the show and let us know because I'm sure somebody listening knows right off the top of their head all about Marvel's Windigo. There you go. WWTT podcast. Where's Josh when we need him? <laughs> all right, he's still tranked. <laughs> Um, okay, so Boyd um, fantasizes killing Cleves for a second and eating his flesh. That was uh, something I totally forgot about on this watch and was like, oh, I don't remember that scene. Um, With the oversized mallet and all. Yeah. It's a great sequence. <laughs> yeah, and again, it totally took me, caught me off guard because I was like, oh, he killed, oh, wait, no, no, it's a dream. Basically to suggest the fact that because Boyd you know, had a taste of flesh. He's not like, he's not like messed up like Calhoun is, um, but he's fighting it the whole time. Like he, he's, he's fighting the temptation to continue to uh, be a cannibal. On the turn, as the British say. Yeah. Um, at this point, you know, uh, he confronts uh, Calhoun and Calhoun explains like there's some exposition here where he says, you know, I started, <laughs> I had suicidal ambition, headaches, tuberculosis, and then I started eating people, and now I'm pretty cool. Well, it was that it was that Indian scout that put the idea in his head, you see. Mm-hmm. Consequently, I ate the scout first. <laughs> With some fiber beans and a nice Chianti. It's Chianti. Hmm. Well, damn, you know. damn Anthony Hopkins not knowing how to pronounce stuff. Ah, <laughs> oh, performance ruined. Take his Oscar away. Uh, uh, no, they did that for uh, that Transformers movie. Well, it? that's fair. <laughs> Actually, he's probably the only one in this in that movie having fun. <laughs> to be honest, because well, if you're, you know, you get to a point where you're just like, this movie's going to be shit. I might mm. as well have a good time while I'm here. Uh, that's what Alan Rickman did with um, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, which is why yeah. his performance is so amazing. Because <laughs> he was like, I'm just going to be a comic book villain. This is. This is garbage. Probably when he saw Kevin Costner turn up to take the lead. You know, he's, so that's why The Sheriff of Nottingham is so fun to watch. Because Alan Rickman was like, I'm just going to be a comic book villain. To hell with this. Get your heart out with a spoon. Yeah. <laughs> Boyd manages, he does manage to cut Calhoun. Um, cut him real bad. But then Calhoun is like, oh, you cut me. Now smell the flesh and the blood. Mm, you like to be a cannibal, don't you? Um, and he attempts to, uh, the guy Pierce or Boyd attempts to kill him. He has a knife to his throat, but then Martha shows up and threatens to take Boyd's life if he, you know, does anything. He because die, she- you die. Exactly. It, it's not a great line, but it gets the point across, and I feel like she delivered it competently. Yeah, and I think it's her second line of the film. <laughs> it's a nice bit of foreshadowing. <laughs> it's all foreshadowing. Spoiler alert. This movie, ba- yeah, this movie is minute one to a hundred foreshadowing. <laughs> uh, well, I guess minute one to 99. Uh, so Knox cleans Calhoun up, again, the drunk veterinarian. While Martha is looking around for Cleves, and she finds Cleves. Where does she find Cleves? Uh, up on the roof. Oh, up okay. On the roof. And he's he's just hanging out. He's just chilling. Well, after the, after she found out that the horses were dead. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Then and then um, he they she she he he was he was up on the roof. Oh, okay, he's fine though, right? Yeah. Dead, oh. dead as fuck, as Brent likes to say. <laughs> and conveniently, I, didn't start bleeding yes. until the exact moment she was yes. standing underneath his corpse. <laughs> right. Not a drop of blood until she's standing there banging on the window rather than opening the door and going inside to tell Major Knox that all the horses are dead. Right. Well, it's 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 a timed kill, right? Um, Calhoun was like, "I'm gonna I'm gonna have fun with this." I'm a I'm a biologist. I know exactly when blood starts dripping. Um, I'll time it right. It's it's a very intricate plan. It, he's basically the um, law-abiding citizen of 1847. I mean, that makes okay. Yeah, you got to know yeah. the temperature, and you know, exactly. what if what if um, he'd been a hemophiliac? That would have thrown off all the figures. Exactly. Yeah, he's been planning this for a while. I mean, to be a meteorologist as well, to know the temperature in that day was pretty impressive. Mm. So, um, yeah, so she finds uh, Cleves, David Arquette, dead as fuck. 
and she um, she agrees to travel and go get another general in place of Boyd, who is now imprisoned. So she leaves, and, and yeah, this is the part again, like like Moxie said, where they're basically like, "All right, Martha, walk to town. Bye." Yeah. We we have decided that someone needs to walk to get uh, General Slauson. That was his name. I couldn't remember it all day. Right, right. Uh, you know, any volunteers? He says to the only other person there is. <laughs> and she just with this this annoyed resignation, you know, puts her hand up, Put, goes, puts and, the goes, hand and up. goes and gets her hat. I guess I'm going. Although it might be the smartest thing she does in this movie. Yeah. Second smartest, certainly. Yeah. I, yeah. Um, so at this point, um, so Knox is still, you know, Knox is still in the dark. He thinks, he still thinks Boyd is, is guilty. He's hanging out with uh, Calhoun, who's making a stew uh, with, you know, Cleves is in there. I'm assuming some horse meat and shit. Uh, uh, probably not horse meat. I think he just eats people. I think it would have been great if um, one of the folks who had actually been put into uh, the cuisine had been named Stu. <laughs> I, I really feel that's a missed opportunity. Yeah, really like was, the writers should have should think long and hard about what yep. they let get away from them. Yeah, like Matthew Lillard's character from Scream. Exactly. Yeah, I gotcha. Hmm. Um, or at least Stuart, because then there could have been like a, a little wink. You know what I mean? Yes, yeah, that's what I mean. Like yeah. they should have been calling him Stuart the entire time, and then when it came around, is like, oh, would you? Could I interest you in some stew? Mm. Eli Roth, put that in your next movie. Yeah, he might. Yeah, yeah. he listens, doesn't he? Yeah, he does. He sends me emails all the time. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, he's uh, got the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh. oh. So Knox is getting drunk, of course, and yelling at Boyd to shut up. But then suddenly, someone uh, we see someone take Knox's sword and stab him and we're like oh okay it must be uh Calhoun but no the door opens to Boyd's room and it's Colonel Hart aka Jeffrey Jones he's alive Mm -hmm. um he apparently was stabbed and then fed human meat and managed to uh uh, heal and I guess he's been all Wendigoed up and his plan, he says, hey, Boyd is like, oh, you're going to kill it's me. It's a verb now, eh? Yeah, the Wendigo to him. Okay. <laughs> Verbing weird's language. Uh. <laughs> uh, and Boyd is all, oh, you're going to kill me now? And he's like, no, no, no. We want you to join us. And he's like, yeah, not going to happen. Um, I don't know why I wrote this down, but I, I don't know if someone says this, but I wrote down, manifest destiny, my sword, my spatula. Okay, the first part is in the film. The second okay. part, might, you might want to save for your therapist. <laughs> I have no idea where you got my sword, my spatula. Um, I'll put a pin in that one. I'm not sure. Because Manifest Destiny is in the part where uh, Ives is uh, explaining the, the grand plan. He's got him and Hart and hopefully soon Boyd. And come springtime, the Oregon Trail is going to start back up and there's going to be hundreds of people heading for new lives in the West, and they all have to come through here. But we won't kill indiscriminately. indiscriminately. We don't, we don't <laughs> want to break up any families, yes. guys. And then he chuckles, and it's beautiful. But, you know, <laughs> we can't do it just the two of us, Jolly Old Heart and I. Mm-hmm. And Boyd says, never, I'll never join you. And Calhoun stabs him in the gut and says, now you're going to die soon uh, unless you take the necessary precautions and eat some human meat. And yes, he, he actually, they, they do a couple of quotes from Ben Franklin in this, <laughs> yeah. which made me to think, are they implying that Benjamin Franklin was a cannibal? I mean, it's in the lexicon. There were tons of skeletons <laughs> under his old house. Oh, well. <laughs> Y'all know about that? There you go. No, I did not. It's actually not uncommon <laughs> under old buildings. It doesn't, it doesn't necessarily mean that Franklin was a serial killer, but I'm saying I'm open Just- to the possibility. <laughs> I'm good with it. It's just that they used his basement as a makeshift catacombs. <laughs> I like to think he killed and then flew his kite. Well, what, do you, what are you else going to do to unwind after, you know, going on a murder spree? He's got to do the exact opposite of, you know, the heightened uh, feeling you have as you're murdering someone, as I'm told, uh, as I've never experienced uh, in my personal life. And I hope he right. was singing the song for Mary Poppins as well. <laughs> let's go yes i hope so too yeah. <laughs> oh i uh, thought it was i love to laugh <laughs> <laughs> i mean that works too 
So or feed, uh, boy, or feed the birds. So you have a grown man <laughs> flying a kite at night, <laughs> singing to himself. There's something unwholesome about that. Yeah, night kite. Good kiting. reference. <laughs> good reference. This is a good group. I actually ended up marrying my husband because of Futurama quotes. So <laughs> there you go. We, the night we met, we just kept dropping increasingly obscure Futurama quotes and and seeing if the other person could keep up. And then two years later, we had a hypno toad wedding cake. Nice. <laughs> See everyone, it works. So Boyd is watching uh, Heart break more walnuts, <laughs> but this time he's breaking them with his hands, which I thought was a funny callback. Um, that he's got like a lot more strength. Obviously, exactly. That's what they're implying. That because we find out that not only does cannibalism cure uh, you know any wounds that you may have, but apparently also cures tuberculosis, mm-hmm. suicidal thoughts, it, it, it just about any. A- any a- anything that ails you, apparently. Yeah, you're basically like just superhuman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like it's like a Captain America serum, basically. There you go. <laughs> well, before that, boy does eventually succumb and has to eat the Nox stew. He doesn't enjoy it, but he does it, and just basically to to survive. And we see that he's recovered. He's still definitely avoiding, though. Uh, you know, turning into a madman or a, or he's not Wendigoed. Um, up. Yeah, he's not when to go up. Um, but he does. Uh, he after he watches uh, Jeffrey Jones break walnuts with his bare hands. Jeffrey has a little bit of a breakdown, and he's basically like, "Like, what have I done with my life? Why did I? Why did I eat people? I'm a monster. Please kill me." Yeah, he pushed out of the whole cannibal thing after about five hours. Yeah, <laughs> he was not committed. He he was he and he seemed to be going along fairly uh, gleefully with it there for yeah, a bit he just too. Like, turns. He just I I, yeah. I do that that is one of the things in this movie. I I do kind of think that's a weird written in turn. Like it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. There was no build up to that pivot. Yeah, really, it it speaks to not making you know rash decisions in the moment. <laughs> well, in fairness, it wasn't his decision. He was being force fed human flesh while he was unconscious no 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 i mean the you know what i'm done with this kill me now oh, okay yeah 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 should have just put a put a pin in that and uh you know, let's sleep see on how it. things we'll see played how out in the morning yeah. exactly but um it does lead to another line that i really like is when robert carlisle is uh looking out and seeing people coming with his binoculars and he says breakfast lunch reinforcements <laughs> And then he has a uh, a blood cross on his forehead. Just for that was interesting. Just for pretty. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 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 Just to really hammer home the symbolism. <laughs> but yeah, Hart is like Jeffrey Jones is like, okay, you got to kill me. You got to kill me. And Boyd doesn't really hesitate for too long. He takes a knife and sl- slits his throat, and he dies. And then we have the the big uh, final showdown between Burl Ives. Uh, I'm sorry. I mean Calhoun and Boyd. The final showdown, which was originally written to take place on the roof of a burning building. Oh. But they thought, that's cool, admittedly, but kind of, you know, kind of been done. Uh, so they just end up with a fight scene that, to me, while far-fetched and ridiculous, it's almost analogous to one of the best fight scenes ever put to film. Uh, that being the alley fight in They Live. Ooh, where it's very good. It's more yeah. realistic to how two people would actually yeah. fight because they get tired. They they you know they hit each other for a few seconds and then they break apart. It's not as good as that, obviously. But then again, and, the one in They Live doesn't have spoiler alert a giant bear trap. <laughs> and the, oh, we yeah, we need to talk about that in a second yeah. here. But um, it, and unlike They Live, though, of course, this movie didn't have uh, Boyd putting on sunglasses that made him hear things. Right. <laughs> and that's so, yeah. where you draw the line. <laughs> that's it. That's the only difference. Well, look, you know, Roddy Piper, you know, bless his cotton socks, was just mad as a shit house rat at the end of his life. So he probably was hearing things. <laughs> CTE will do that to you. You're not They're wrong. Right. Answer. Uh, well, he, no. I'm, can, yes, but two yeah, things think, can be true. I think he also. <laughs> I think he also had some issues. <laughs> Other than that, um, so they're squaring off. Yeah, like you said, it's a, it's a. I like this fight scene too. Um, Boyd has like a pitchfork. He stabs him with it. Uh, Calhoun gets him several times with a knife. Um, he, Boyd manages to hack his arm with a cleaver at one point, and then beats on him with a tree branch, which I liked as well. 
um, but then gets stabbed in the back and the roof collapses. And then the final moment, as you mentioned, um, they both land in a huge bear trap, which I'm assuming means that there is a part of this movie they didn't explore in which everyone is trying to catch giants. Yeah, because it's... (laughs) I thought animal traps were meant to catch feet. This looks like it's big enough to catch a bear around the middle. Yeah, and Boyd like for- pushes them, them both into it so it closes on them. Yeah, California grizzly, <laughs> which is on the flag yeah. but hasn't been in the state for 150 years. Right, but it would have been in the state yeah, at, at the, the time. time yeah. yeah, probably. So. I, check I just, I just, I, I, having watched this, I had to pause the movie because again, like you said, I was. Uh, taken aback by the size of that bear trap <laughs> it was for me it was the uh the the best bear trap death since straw dogs <laughs> i think you're gonna say the best bear trap death since uh ticks no no i mean that's that's fine and well but i mean that one is all just through uh blundering and idiocy like again who puts bear traps around a place they're going to be working you know with a lot of foot traffic i'm infected Thank you, Clint. <laughs> I don't know. I know a lot of sideshow performers. They've got animal traps laying all over some of them. Well, there you go. So maybe that was maybe yeah. that's what happened, uh, Nathan. So Clint uh, Clint Howard's character in Tix was not only was he growing like toxic weed, but he was also training uh, animals for the circus. Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay, it checks out. No, he himself was building up to putting body parts in in that trap. Like a uh, performer I know out of DC, Mab just Mab. Uh, puts her her tongue in a mouse trap and her hand in a beaver trap and stuff like that. Intriguing. Yeah. Everybody's got to earn a living. Yep. So uh, while ravenous. they're in the trap, yeah, ravenous. <laughs> so while they're in the trap, uh, <laughs> Calhoun is basically like, you, "If you die before me, I'm gonna eat you to survive." So Boyd is like struggling to stay alive longer than Calhoun, so that doesn't happen, and they both die. Mm -hmm. And Martha comes up and sees the bodies. Well, she sees them before Boyd is, like, still alive. And props to Martha because she's not having either of them and takes her sweet-ass time leaving. (laughs) She's she's just like, you know what? That's enough white people. (laughs) That is enough white people. I am out of (laughs) here. That'll do, pig. That'll do. And she just, peace out. Yep. Meanwhile, generals invade the camp uh, and uh, they, they... do a quick taste test of the stew, which I'm like, oh no, the Wendigo continues. <laughs> the um, end question the end? mark? Yeah. Ravenous too? Unfortunately not. <laughs> well, I, mean, I, just, I, love, I love the line there at the end. If you die first, I am definitely going to eat you. <laughs> the question <laughs> is, what are you going to do? Go on have to eat. Almost delivered in a sexual manner. I can't help that it sounds sexy when I do it, okay? <laughs> oh, I mean, in the movie, too, it sounds sexy as well. Well, yeah, of course it sounds sexy when Robert Carlyle does it. That just goes without saying. So that's ravenous. Tis. So, Moxie, as our guest, uh, we usually, you know, go around the horn here. Um, obviously, I mean, this is a rhetorical question, but would you recommend ravenous? Yes, I absolutely recommend everyone check it out. Uh, it's really worthwhile. It, it just got mishandled. Is it perfect? Of course not. There's even stuff in it I don't like. But it is really good, and you've got to hear the score. But you have to hear it, it during the film, because if you just, like, download the soundtrack, <laughs> it's not going to do you any freaking good. Yeah, you're going to be really confused. Uh, Nathan, I know uh, you're somewhere in the middle here. Oh, no, okay. I, I do recommend it. Um, it's if you know what you're getting when you're going into it. Mm-hmm. Um, because, uh, like we said earlier, the, the studio didn't really know what to do with it. Um, you know, they met, they, the way it was marketed, if I remember correctly, was more of towards a, uh, a straight survival horror type, uh, thing. There was, they didn't play up any of the, um, you know, uh, the dark comedic elements that you get in the movie, um, or anything like that. Uh, I would absolutely recommend it, and I would also recommend it as a double bill with uh, Cannibal the Musical. Oh, that would make for a great Saturday night, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so, I mean, I, yeah, I've seen this movie quite a few times uh, back in the day when I, when, again, I was 
floored by this movie when I first watched it years ago because, again, I had no idea what it was. And then having discovered it, I was delighted to watch it. Um, yeah, this is a very entertaining, crazy movie. Uh, Robert Carlyle at his absolute best. And, I mean, yeah, we said Guy Pierce doesn't say much, but, I mean, he's, he's a pretty good, like, brooding character. Um, yeah, he, he's in this solid movie. in everything. Yeah. And, and everyone else is fun. Guy Pierce. David Arquette does some fun stuff. Jeremy Davies is fun. You know, um, Neil McDonough is good. It's all good. Everyone's good all around. It's it's a ridiculous, insane movie, but yeah, I think people should watch it. And it's on that good. note, we have, we have a consensus. We unanimously <laughs> vote that as soon as you're finished with this episode, drop everything you're doing and find Ravenous. You pass the test. And now, we absolutely, take our word of it. <laughs> that's that's later, Nathan. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> and now uh, we are going to take a brief break and we will be right back. And if you don't mind, guys, I am just going to take a quick bathroom break uh, and I'll be right back. What were they thinking? What were they thinking is brought to you by HostGator. HostGator is a leading provider of shared, reseller, VPS, and dedicated hosting solutions. Award-winning support is available 24-7, 365 days a year via phone, email, and live chat. Discover why over 9 million websites trust HostGator. Use the coupon code SCHLUCK for 25% off your first purchase. That's SCHLUCK, S-C-H-L-O-C-K, for 25% off your first purchase. What Were They Thinking is brought to you today by GameItAll.com. Whether it's video game news, the latest in music, or movie reviews, GameItAll.com is your one-stop shop for all nerdy talk. What were they thinking? And we're back. Yes, we are back. Mm Mm-hmm. Are we getting sexy? I want to get in on this. Oh, we well, you know, the conservative sexy. This is NPR so, so, after all. This is NPR. Okay, so um, it's more of a more of an ASMR than an S and M. Right. I can work with that. All right. Yes, uh, that's that's exactly what's going on at this point in time. Nathan, what is it time for? Well, Brandon, it is time for the low haiku. Mm-hmm. And what is the low haiku? Well, the low haiku is uh, 17 perfect syllables uh, to describe a movie we've just spent the last hour and some change talking about. Perfect. So we're each going to do that. Uh, Moxie, as our guest, would you like to begin with your haiku? Well, I went uh, full length. Because oh. haiku, haiku doesn't just mean one stanza. We like mm. to think of it as one stanza because, hell, that's easier. Um, so my brain was like... Hey, you start recording in two minutes. Let's write out the whole film in haiku. I'm like, great brain. Thank you. (laughs) All right. In California, at remote Fort Spencer, the bored crew expands. A frostbitten man tells tales of desperation, madness, and hunger. Travelers eating the flesh of one another. Reluctantly, then, one eats with gusto, growing monstrously strong and begins to kill. The soldiers go forth to rescue the last person, but she is eaten. The stranger attacks. The soldiers fall one by one. Only one escapes. He's eaten the dead. He regains his strength and more. He is Windigo, a walking hunger that eats the flesh of mortals, cannot eat enough. The soldier tries in vain to talk to his general, but no one believes. A new CO arrives, but it is the Windigo. Still no one believes. The soldier must fight, but the Windigo is strong. It has fed well. To kill the Windigo, you must sacrifice yourself. Can the soldier win? So that's what I was doing while you were waiting for me to get online. Well, I'd just like to congratulate you. I think that is the most our uh, guests have ever worked on the little haiku. So thank you very much. That was wonderful. Here, here. I originally here, was going to write a, I was originally thinking perfection. of writing a dirty limerick, but I kept, I kept one more thing in this that today, you know, when you're like, I'll get to that. Just let me do one more thing. Just let me do one more thing. I got to start recording in five minutes. Oh boy. <laughs> 
we we uh i'm glad you went with the haiku as i don't know how our sponsors dave's potato salad would have reacted to a dirty limerick dave's potato salad when the second best will do i mean if you write it correctly you know uh nathan did you want to go next yes yes okay Okay. hungry for horror Golden Corral's new slogan. Carlisle's new spokes gig. Love it, love it. Snap it up. Very good, very good, very good. <clears throat> okay. Human meat is yum. Arquette super high and dumb. Scottish Wendigo. Thank you. Thank you. This is a really strange beat poetry night. <laughs> Well, yeah, this is uh, this part of what we do 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 do. Yeah. Oh, hey, I'm out. Yeah, how's it going? We're out. We're out. We're out. We're out. Uh, okay. Well, Nathan, um, we yes, Brandon. Three, three of us uh, caught me off guard with that one. The three of us talked about this movie, but what do we always say? Well, I've been told that we always say. Don't take a word for us. Yes, that's right, Nathan. We say don't take our word for it. Right. Yes, it is. Um, And I don't know, man, because uh, it seems to me the the audience and critics are torn quite far apart. They are. This is one of those times where there is a bit of a disagreement here. And I feel Mm -hmm. like it's stemming from the fact, as we all kind of talked about earlier, where this movie wasn't really accepted that much at the time of its release. It wasn't um, marketed properly, yeah, in my opinion. Yeah, exactly. I feel like this is... I don't know. I feel like if this was released today, I also don't know if it would be the same. I, I also feel like it, the opposite would happen for some reason. Like I feel like because it kind of subverts the genre a little bit, that I feel mm-hmm. like it might be an opposite situation here. But I mean, that, that's just my opinion. I don't know. It, it feels like a, kind of like an A24 situation to me. Okay, okay. It's a piece um, of paper? <laughs> what? A24 is a type of paper. Oh, oh you it's got not me. actually. <gasps> but but the joke was that it sounded like that and I would be extra foolish <laughs> and extra not knowing what the hell you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so critics 47% liked this movie. Uh mm-hmm. 60 reviews. So, I mean, there's a fair deal, but not a ton. Uh audience rating, however, 78% approval. Yep. So let's get let's get uh, started with some of these critics reviews here. Um, first one is from Philip French of The Guardian, who says Ravenous is a stupid black comedy set in the same place and the same year, but more a Western version of Night of the Living Dead. It's hitting all the selling points. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Stephen Thompson of the AV Club, he had some scathing words for this um, last October. <laughs> Ravenous. Uh, will doubtless find some sort of cult following, but that cult will be following a lousy, ill-conceived movie. Oof. Yeah, it's because cults are so good about picking what they're following. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. There's there's this guy, Mike, over at Aisle Seat, who gave it a low numerical score, but the blurb here, I think, is actually pretty positive. Ravenous is unlike anything else, and even if it's not to my own specific taste, I have great respect for its unrepentant weirdness. <laughs> so why'd you only give it a two out of four, you cunt? Oh, ho. <laughs> sorry, take it's that. Oh. Sorry, what's That's what's true. his name again? Uh, that is Mike McGranahan. Yeah. Don't add us, Mike. <laughs> I thought his last name was going to be Hunt. <laughs> <laughs> That would be pretty perfect. Um, (laughs) Roger Ebert, good old Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times, says, Of course a vampire is simply a cannibal with good table manners, and Ravenous is a darkly atmospheric film about an epidemic of flesh-eating and the fearsome power that it brings. He actually gave it a positive review. Yeah, that should be on the poster. That sounded great. Yeah. (laughs) Give me that first line again. Uh, The analogy. a, A vampire is simply a cannibal with good table manners. I'm going to have that tattooed on me. (laughs) <laughs> right on the inner bicep. That's great. 
<laughs> uh, Simon Abrams uh, from the Village Voice liked it. Uh, imagine a film that makes uh, a modest proposal style satire uh, out of Dracula's gothic horror tropes in the spaghetti western milieu of The Great Silence. It's a pitch black comedy about manifest destiny and cannibal frontiersmen. And that was a beautiful summation. All the genres that are, are mashed up in this. That's who should have been doing the marketing. <laughs> Manifest Destiny, which, of course, according to my earlier note that I still don't understand, somehow involves spatulas. I'm not sure. And uh, swords. <laughs> well, it is swords, I think. I think that that part mm. is correct. I mean, spatula comes from the same, the root word, a root word meaning sword, but I still don't know how you got there. I mean, <laughs> you know if, what? If I, you ever think of it, call me in the middle of the night because I'll be dying to hear. <laughs> <laughs> Answer your Skype. <laughs> Well, uh, I'm going to have to throw hands with uh, Janet Maslin over at the New York Times. I want to throw hands with them anyway for, we notice you're using an ad blocker. Yeah, do you notice I don't care? Because uh, Janet Maslin said, if there's anything worse than a cannibal movie, it's an undead cannibal movie with the pretensions about manifest destiny in the American West. And the problems with Antonia Bird's Ravenous don't end there. Well, why don't you tell us how you really feel, Janet? I hereby it, declare Janet shall be the next Karen. Oh shit! <laughs> it has been decided. Mm-hmm. I also like we didn't really mention that, but yeah, this is a. It's kind of cool that it was also a female director behind this uh, behind this movie. Yeah, the, uh, the male director was sacked about three weeks in for just being oh. too difficult. Oh well, it's shocker. And also, the uh, exterior shots were done in Slovakia. Oh, okay. So they didn't have to. Uh, though I do have to go back and check that. One instance of fake snow. They didn't otherwise have to uh, bring in or manufacture snow. Slovakia provided snow. Nathan has made you second guess this movie for just a brief moment. No, 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 not not second guess. If anything, he's given me an excuse to go back and watch it. Not like I needed one. There There you go. go. Shall we move on to the audience reviews, friends? Yes, let's dive into the snake pit. Well, Cody C gives this four stars. And he's very clever. He might he might as well stand. It might as well stand for clever, and he, his name should be Cody Clever, because he says, "I'll never understand why critics didn't eat this one up." Oh, and then he took the rest <laughs> of the day off. <laughs> Clocked his time card and went home for the day. <laughs> uh, Sylvester K, uh, which I assume means Sylvester Cat, uh, <laughs> writes. Based on the legend of Alfred Packer, Raveneth is a supernatural spin on the original story by introducing the mythical Wendigo into this tale of cannibalism. It was darkly humorous. Everyone performed well beyond expectation, even though the budget is only suited for a B-movie. Um, actually, Sylvester, okay, we don't know that it has anything to do with Alfred Packer just because there's cannibals in the mountains. Okay. He gave it three. <laughs> Which is why I'm, I'm actuallying him with my up talk and my vocal fry. That's what you get. Uh, if only you okay, had done Janet. the voice of Tweety Bird. <laughs> I, would love to, I would love to hear Tweety Bird sounding like a Visco girl. That would be... Um, I taught I taught a putty tat. <laughs> I did? I did taught a putty tat? <laughs> oh... From our good friend, Timothy R., who gave it four and a half stars. And that's legit. It was not perfect. There were some problems. A well-deserved cult classic. Don't listen to these fatuous, flabby, naysaying reviewers. They all have their sanctimonious thumbs stuffed up their asses. These are the (laughs) same sorts that gave Ken Russell's The Devils the raspberry. I absolutely loved Ravenous, and so will fans of crazed cinema. Screw them! Thank you. Thank you, Timothy. Wow, he came to play. Timothy's not messing around. Um, I've got someone that may be just as passionate, but on the opposite side of the of the spectrum here. Uh, from Jim S., who gives it one star. What do you get when you take a bizarre script, some over-the-top acting and directing, some really bad editing, and a big bucket of blood and guts? You get this undercooked piece of crap masquerading as combination horror flick western with a lot of tongue-in-cheek sequences so to speak give this one a wide berth oh you thought you were so clever didn't you man you're lucky i don't know where you live 
<laughs> Wait, there's an address underneath here. Uh, I'll cut this out of the episode, but it's... <laughs> It says fight me. <laughs> <laughs> oh wait, he's uh, in West Virginia. <laughs> that's not far. <laughs> I've I've got one here uh, from Corey T. Um, I can only mean, know that. I think that means Corey Trevor. I hope so. Uh, f- from Sunnyvale Trailer Park. Unjustly, unjustly maligned upon its release, Ravenous is like a unique, atmospheric, and stingingly funny horror comedy with a splendid ensemble cast. Cannibalism is a subject that can cause nausea in most people, but it is handled with depth, comedic touch, and Ted Griffin's shrewd cr- screenplay. Bam. Well, here is a bad review, but I do want to give the writer, Michael H., so there might be our Mike Hunt, I do want to <laughs> give him credit for the erudite way in which that he did it. The bones of a good movie are here, supported by a few tasty performances, a savory score, and the delightful confection of credibly period-accurate, though a bit overly flambéed, sets. Sadly, the hearty bones and tasty toppings are unfulfilled by the undercooked meat. The courses are served at too slow a pace. All right, I'll give you something there. And the most interesting and tasty ingredients are dispensed with early on. The result is a longing for dessert to be served rather than an enjoyment of the meal in front of us, and the dessert is a bit of a letdown. Mike, I will forgive your lack of taste, no pun intended, for your fabulous writing skills. <laughs> okay, so this one, this is actually going to be my last one here. This is from uh, Jennifer C., and she gives this movie five stars. This movie is definitely a great watch. It's one that you'll want to watch snuggled up close to someone special, dot, 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 as long as they're not hungry. Oh, I see what you did there, Jennifer. I, If I were Jennifer, I think I might want to be eaten. I'm just going to put that out there. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, yeah, that's it. That's all I have. I have one last one uh, from Gary B. I can only assume that it's Gary Busey. Oh, God. Well, you got to do the voice. Yeah, I will. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Surprising, unexpected, four stars. <laughs> I can see him writing that. You sound like Sylvester the Cat on meth. <laughs> Which is what Gary Busey sounds yeah, like. You just described Gary Basically. <laughs> yeah. uh, do, you, do you have any other ones, Moxie? So we're going to end with a, a middling review of someone who is fundamentally at his core and possibly as a person wrong. <laughs> the music doesn't fit the movie. Well, well, that's bullshit. But then he does redeem it unknowingly by saying, it makes it even creepier. Thank you, that was the point. <laughs> Jesus, I'm glad you were here to tell us this. This is like a strange vampire wilderness movie, because that's a thing. It's not a vampire movie, but there is a lot of blood and flesh eating. This is a weird, strange, and suspenseful movie. It's not a great movie, but interesting. And I'd say that's a fair assessment. I mean, cards on the table. I would watch a, a weird uh, vampire <laughs> wilderness movie. Yeah, I think I, I. I mean, I'm sure I've seen one. Like I can't think of any, but I'm sure I've seen one. <laughs> so that's it. That's Ravenous, 1999. I yeah, I do want to jump on board there as well and join in on saying that anybody who says the score is strange that is yes that is the point of the score is to that it doesn't quite fit that's what makes Mm -hmm. it so effective it's gorgeous it is um so i think that about does it for the movie um now i do want to drop a little hint ski for next week before we go any further a little hint okay uh a clue Something to to tell us what uh, what would what to expect. Yeah, just a little morsel of uh, ooh. Do it in uh, the form of a riddle. A, a t- <laughs> oh no, I'm not prepared. <laughs> a, a taste, if you will. Answer me these questions three. <laughs> Wait, I don't know that. Ah. Um. But okay, I'll just I'll just. This is your little hint for the film we are covering next week, which, by the way, is a Patreon pick. Mm-mm-mm. A bus. Ahoy, matey. Okay. There we go. That's what's coming next week. Now is Moxie gets to meet Montrose Monkton for the first time. This is very exciting. Is Montrose there? 
He is, yeah, and I've actually managed to keep him off the sauce, so this isn't going to be the same as like last time. Okay. We have we have a we have a a, a a monkey on the show who you get to meet now. Ah. Hey, Chimp, thank you very much. Sorry. Hello, it's your good friend Montrose Munkington the Third here, and I must say it is an absolute pleasure uh, to meet you, uh, Ms. Labouche. Well, the pleasure is all mine. I'm sure it is. Um, I, I would like to invite you um, and also all of the listeners out there uh, to, to enjoy my, my YouTube channel, uh, Montrose Munkington TV. Uh, if you like what you see there and you, you would like to be friends with Montrose, uh, you, get, you go to Facebook uh, and, and join the group uh, Montrose Munkington III Esquire and Friends. Uh, and also, if you'd like to uh, send me a, a little quips and, 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 and one-liners, I'd be more than glad to hear them. Uh, at, at, I'm on Twitter, at Montrose the Third. That's the number three RD. Thank you. Oh, later. Thank you, Montrose. And speaking of plugs... You're welcome. <laughs> Moxie, you also have a podcast. Tell the good people, the listeners, where they can find you and your podcast. Well, if you enjoyed the bonus facts that I slipped into this episode, you can check out Your Brain on Facts, your weekly half hour of things you never knew you never knew. Available on the same program you're using to listen to this fine show. And if you want the facts, but for whatever reason don't want to listen to my beautiful NPR diction, you can get the Your Brain on Facts book. Check with your local bookseller first from a safe distance. They need your love now more than ever. Failing that... You can always give Bezos a couple extra bucks. <laughs> Boo. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, see, Nathan, that's what we need to do. We need to write a book. Oh, way ahead of you. Oh, oh, sweet. Get started right now. <laughs> it's mostly cuss words. Uh, that's fair. I'll, re- I'll put you onto my publisher. <laughs> Yay, we did and, it. <laughs> and, I can, and I can narrate the audio book, because if you don't want the facts but want the voice instead, I am also available for voiceover work. See, there we go. We're all, all set. The plugs in. <laughs> and you can find my LinkedIn account. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, well, again, I just before we move forward, I just want to say uh, once again, thank you very much for being on this show. It was a delight to talk about Ravenous with you. It was just a delight to talk about it again and to know that I have inflicted it on at least one more person. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, so... That having been said, you can also find us on all the podcatchers, of course. If you're listening right now, you know where we're at. Uh, we're on Podbean at www.ttpodcast.podbean.com and any other podcatcher you choose to listen to. We're also on Twitter and Instagram at www.ttpodcast. And we're on Facebook. Just search for What Were They Thinking? Uh, we're also on Patreon at patreon.com slash podcast And Redbubble and TeePublic. Just search for us. And you will find us. Exactly. Now, Nathan, Mm -hmm. just to wrap this up, just to wrap this up in a neat, nice little bow. Right. Do you have any questions for moi? I have a few questions, Portois. Okay. Okay, so I guess in a movie Mm. where, um, you know, Trey Parker uh, did a much funnier. <laughs> and with a movie where uh, the studio clearly bungled uh, the marketing of this, and we could have had a whole genre, um, uh, including this and Cannibal the Musical. Um, and with a movie where Guy Pierce has conservatively 50 words to say. <laughs> And yes. also, we're, we're in a movie where, where the two n- native characters are named George and Martha. Mm-hmm. I, I have to ask. Yeah? What were they thinking? In Colorado Rockies where the snow is deep and cold And a man afoot can starve to death unless he's brave and bold They sing of Alfred Packer and some of them still rave by the Hinsdale County Democrats who never saw a grave. Old Packard set out on a trip with five of his old friends in the Colorado Rockies in the snow and howling winds. But the way was long and weary, and the food got mighty short. 
But Alfred had his dinner on the very last resort Oh, Alfred Packer, he'll surely go to hell While all the others starved to death, you dined a bit too well Oh, Packer, fat and healthy, came down onto the plains he was lonely, he was horny, but he had no stomach pains When he told his story, it made the strong men pale So they grabbed old Alfred Packer and they flung him into jail They brought old Packer to the court and had a speedy trial A gory tale, it was told, that went into the fire Testimony shook the judge who trembled where he sat He was horrified, but then of course he was a Democrat Oh, Alfred Packer, please tell me for my sake Did the hens step